Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Ramos, and I'm an associate professor at the School of Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo. I'm also an associate scientific director uh, of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, and I, along with help from Laura Lawson, Valdi Pietro, and now Sue Johnston, uh, and uh, putting together uh, these uh, monthly seminars for CLSA. So I'll stop talking and just one note quickly, because we often get feedback, we tend not to use the talk feature, it should be disabled, but if you have questions, please use the chat feature to type in your questions and when Mike has finished his presentation, I will relay his question, your questions to him. So our talk today is going to be called The Income Distribution of Canada's Seniors the top end and everyone else, and I'm happy to introduce our speaker. Professor Michael Beal is a full professor in the Department of Economics at McMaster University, and his main research interests include applied econometrics and economic statistics. Uh, some of his focus recently has been on the distribution of income in Canada and tax transfer policy. He collaborates on projects involving productivity growth and the relationship of health and economic status. He was president of the Canadian Economics Association uh, between 2011 and 2012, and he has also participated on the CLSA's social working group. So, Michael, give the floor over to you, and thank you very much for agreeing to participate and give this seminar today. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I will say first that I'm going to be talking largely about joint work uh, with Brian Murphy principally and some with Hung Pham of Statistics Canada. And I thank them for their permission to do this. Uh, and I also have to issue the disclaimer that neither they nor Statistics Canada are responsible for any errors or any opinions in this presentation. I will note that the data I'm about to use or present is actually going to be updated in probably within a month. And so already this presentation will be update, out of date by the end of this month. Uh, some of the data is to 2011 and some is to 2010. Uh, because it makes so little difference, I, have, I will not be all that precise as to which, but if people have questions for me afterwards or want to contact me afterwards for some precision on that point, they can ask me. I want to uh, point out that Statistics Canada now includes estimates of top shares of income distribution using tax dollar data but CANSEN does not yet include information about the top end income distribution by age, uh, so this is what I'm trying to fill in, a little bit of a gap here. Uh, for those of you who don't know about this data, it's anonymized tax filer data, what Statistics Canada is called the Longitudinal, Longitudinal Administrative Data Bank. Uh, it starts in 1982, and nowadays has about 5 million observations per year, it's a one-fifth sample. And it's got pretty good coverage from 1992 on. What makes the early 90s special is there started to become more and more tax delivered benefits. And so therefore, people at the low end of the income distribution had strong incentives to join the, uh, the data in effect by filing tax returns because the filing of tax returns uh, had uh, monetary yields for them. Uh, there are lots of shortcomings, however, in tax data. One of them, of course, is misreporting. Uh, there can be misreporting in surveys, uh, but perhaps a different nature of misreporting when it's for tax purposes. On one hand, uh, there are penalties for misreporting. On the other hand, there can be advantages. Uh, we do know about the underground economy. We do know about tax havens. Uh, I have done rather a lot of work on uh, small business and pri small private corporation income, uh, private, private corporation income in general, and people can ask me about that issue later if they want. Uh, as I just indicated, there is a filing bias, although that mostly is gone now in the data. Uh, there isn't that much filing bias left because, uh, but still, of course, some people do not file. Uh, we're going to uh, focus on before tax market income. Uh, that includes wages and salaries and self employment income, investment income, pensions, things like that. Um, I'm not going to include capital gains, although I can. Uh, uh, capital gains are bumpy, and of course, the year you realize the capital gain is not quite the same thing as the year in which you truly earned it. 
Uh, so we're just going to leave that complication aside for today, although, again, I'll answer questions about it. I've done a lot of work with capital gains as well. And the um, transfer payments aren't included. We're not talking today, or I'm not going to talk so much today about the welfare of the older population, but I'm going to instead emphasis on their earnings process, how they participate in the, uh, the labor market and other markets which earn income for them. So, and the other specialization is that I'm going to concentrate on the top 1%, which is what the Occupy movement uh, was about. Uh, I am going to describe as we go why I think that's particularly interesting. Okay. So, early questions you could ask me. First, is the over, older population over or underrepresented in the top 1% of all income recipients? And the answer, as you can read there, is that they're underrepresented. Um, uh, there, there are few fewer of them in the top 1% than you would expect. Uh, are older members of the top 1% different from younger members? And yes is the answer. If you are in the top 1% and you're older, you're likely to have a higher average income. Uh, not surprisingly, you're less likely to be uh, earning labor income, that is, work less. Um, but if you're employed, uh, you probably also earn, uh, earn less. So the big difference, of course, there is capital incomes. I'm not going to be talking so much about that. Instead, I'm going to be thinking about the older group in itself. In other words, rather than thinking of the role of the older population in the 1% for the whole economy, I'm going to be talking about uh, the shares within uh, the older uh, population and, and also other age groups as we go along. Uh, so here's the first table. And of course, there's going to be lots of numbers. I'm going to try to make it not too um, daunting for you. Uh, but those numbers give you the idea of what, to be, what it's like to be in the top 1%. So the first thing you can see in the top left-hand corner is that the threshold in 2011 uh, to be in the top 1% was $208,000. So if you earned $208,000, uh, you'd be in the top 1% overall. But that number would be lower uh, if you were uh, 66. So you can see those two numbers I've just circled. And uh, so it's a little easier to be in the top 1% of the 66 plus population than it is the overall population. Then the rest of those numbers, you can see, um, they follow a, a probably an expected pattern. Uh, if you're thinking about the 0 to 35 age group, some filers can be very young, then it doesn't take so much income to be in the top 1%, only 127,000. Um, the place where it takes the most income to be in the top 1% is the 36 to 55 year old group. And then after that, you can see it tails off more or less smoothly with age. If we go on to the average income for uh, the top 1%, 5%, and 10%, uh, now we're talking about not the amount to be in the group, but the averages of those that are in the group. And you can see, again, that the average income of the top 1% in Canada is $441,000 uh, in 2011. And the average income of those 66 plus is 403 thousand, that is, at the top 1% of all those who are 66 plus is 403,000. And you can see the rest of the pattern more or less looks the same as we described before with a couple of bumps. But basically, um, it is uh, highest, uh, well, actually, it's a little higher in the 56 to 65 group now, but then it starts moving smoothly declining with, as I say, a couple of bumps. Um, so let's look at these other ones. Basically, you can see it gets to a point in all of these age distributions uh, near the bottom, where there's actually not that great a difference. So there's not a big difference between the 66 to 70 year olds uh, in all those numbers than there is between the 80 plus, um, even to some extent in the lower 90, although that's perhaps the biggest thing. Notice, of course, that sharp contrast when you go to the lower 90 at the far right, how much the numbers fall off, and that's something we're going to be talking about uh, more as we go on. Now, Let's shift to consider top shares within different age classes, i.e. the distribution of income by age group. Okay, so uh, we're looking at the distribution of the wages. So you can see the top 1% normally have pretty good labor market participation. Uh, when you go to the 66 plus of the top 1%, their labor market participation is only 56%. Um, that is, I shouldn't say labor market, this is two T4 income, so this means employment income as employees, 56%. But still it is the case that you know, the top 1% uh, and the top 5% have much higher labor participation rates than, say, the bottom 90%. So in fact, that's the, number, the numbers I'm going to concentrate on. If you look at that 66 plus age group, you can see that there's a huge difference in labor force 
participation, uh, employment income between the top 1% uh, and the bottom 90%. That is, the, uh, only 13% of the bottom 90%, that's nine tenths of the population, obviously, only 13% of those earn any T4 income at all. Okay. Uh, sorry, I think I just went the wrong way, so I'll try to fix that. Okay, how many are self-employed? And again, you can see that same kind of pattern, although there are lower numbers. Um, of the bottom 90%, only 6% are self-employed of those 66 plus. Uh, but of those 66 plus in the top 1%, 27% of them are self-employed. Uh, how many receive invested income? Well, again, there's a sharp contrast there. You can see of the top 1%, 93% earned some invested income, uh, and only 53% of the bottom 90. How many receive private pension income? Well, there the contrast isn't so sharp, is it? Uh, you can see, in fact, that the top 1% aren't the biggest holders of pension income. So this is largely not a pension story, the top 1%. That's, that's not where their income comes from. So uh, before I go on, I'm going to tell you some, a few asides here that just, I think, uh, frame some of my uh, major points. Top 1% of 66 plus receive 20% of all market income, all right? So that's, in fact, more concentrated than for the all-age distribution, right? It's only 12% for everybody, but 20% of the top 66 plus. So it's, market income is concentrated in, in fewer people. In fact, if you go to wage income, you can see it's really concentrated. 43% uh, of all 66 plus wage income is earned just by the top 1%. Uh, comparable for all the rest of the population is 11%. So you can see, uh, being a major wage earner in the top 60, in the 66 plus age group, being the top 1%, uh, it's, yeah, it's a much more concentrated thing. It's much a rarer thing. Um, and then you can see, if you look at investment income, it's 32% of all investment income. So in fact, wage income, labor income, is much more concentrated for the 66 plus population within the top 1% than is investment income. And before I knew these numbers, that wouldn't have been my guess. And then, in, uh, consistent with the slide I just showed you, you can see the pension income is not particularly concentrated um, in the top 1% of those 66 plus. So I've shown you a lot of numbers, so I'm going to take a little bit of a break and tell you my conclusions so far before I show you some more numbers. Uh, Top share inequality is partly but not solely a life cycle effect. You can see some things that go through the life cycle, um, but it's, that's not everything that's going on. Uh, senior top share inequality <coughs> is labor income inequality even more than its investment income inequality. Uh, so that's that last slide I showed you with uh, the labor income being so concentrated even relative to investment income. Much of senior labor income is concentrated at the top end. And that's interesting because that's at levels largely beyond transfer system disincentives. Okay, so if we think about um, things like the GIS system or even the uh, Canada Pension Plan, or sorry, the uh, uh, Old Age Security Clawback, uh, most of those disincentives have long gone away before we're talking about the top 1% where a big chunk, almost the majority of uh, labor income is earned. And so uh, those disincentives really don't have much to do with the majority of labor income that's earned by the older population. And then there's a tension between intergenerational equity and the sensitivity of senior income to taxes. Um, uh, the trouble is, is that when we estimate these things, and I've done some work doing this, is we, we uh, find estimates which suggest that uh, senior income, uh, labor participation and supply is much more sensitive to taxes than, than everyone else, essentially because they have a retirement decision. Uh, and so uh, when we think about perhaps some people's idea of a, quote, remedy, unquote, to uh, this distribution of income uh, being so concentrated at the top, uh, if you go with the tax route, it might be that you, in fact, discourage a lot of that earning. Uh, so at some level, you'll, you'll reduce the, um, the unequalness of the distribution, but the main way you'll have done that is by lowering the amount of uh, labor uh, income earned by the older population as a whole. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned before, the private pension income is not spectacularly large at the top end. So I'm going to conclude. Uh, by talking about some trends. And so at least we get to switch to pictures now. So here's the trend uh, since 1982 when this particular data source started of average market income. Uh, and you can see the top 1% for all ages and the top 1% for 66 plus. And I think the main story there is particularly when during the period where we we're starting to be a little more confident in the quality of the data in the early 90s, uh, those two pictures are basically identical. 
the only thing is the average market income of the older population is a little lower, and that is basically because they earn uh, less employment income. Uh, but it's, it's not a different story, and you might even not notice those two lines at the bottom for all filers uh, of all ages and all filers, filers 66 plus. You can see their market income has been pretty much flat and low uh, during this period, whether you're an all filer or you're 66 plus. Uh, that's um, that's uh, a very stable trend. Uh, during a period in which the top 1% uh, income actually went up quite substantially, and this is in real terms. Uh, so this is uh, something that indicates that there has been a trend over the last 30 or so years that uh, has led to a higher concentration of income both for seniors uh, and for the general population. Uh, so aside, why might this matter? And I'm not, this is not the talk in which I'm, I go in that direction, but just to make a couple of general observations. Uh, when I think of this for the general population, I, I personally frame the issue as not so much that I'm worried about the affluent getting richer, uh, but that the less affluent aren't. In fact, I don't have a real problem with the affluent getting richer, but it's just uh, the unequalness. Well, the consequence of the unequalness means that the lower income people are not getting uh, big increases, and I think that's a matter of concern. The obvious big politics question, which I'm not answering, is, is the reason the affluent um, are gaining, is that at the expense of the less affluent? Is that the reason for this, or is, are those two things not associated? Uh, I won't answer the question today, but I will say that I think to some extent I believe that uh, the less affluent are not doing as well as they might because uh, of institutional factors that favor the affluent. But I, again, that's not my main theme. If, it, if you want it to come out in questions. Um, as you can read, I think the biggest danger from top-end inequality, um, and not particularly senior inequality, is probably through the political system. Uh, there's much writing on this topic, uh, but the basic idea is as the elites in society become more powerful, um, they start to set the agenda. And uh, they set the agenda in ways that tend to favor them. In the senior case, I don't think that this is really a and us versus them in the conventional sense. But I do think it is the case that sometimes uh, high income seniors uh, are more influential in the way we think about problems. So one of the problems we think about at the high, uh, about seniors, of course, is uh, their participation in society in different ways, their ability to keep in the labor market, things like that as being very important issues, and, and no doubt they are. Uh, but we shouldn't let those issues dominate ones that are probably more important to lower income seniors who already have basically made the decision of not participating in the labor market, uh, where they're more interested in uh, income support and uh, uh, whether they can have a higher standard of living. For people who by and large are not uh, what we in Canada classify as poor, but are really just uh, a little bit above uh, the groups that we usually call poor. Uh, now we go back to income source, um, and now what I'm doing is I'm comparing uh, 2011 and 1994, and there are the percentage differences, um, and this is all seniors, not just uh, top 1% seniors, uh, and you can see the big trend uh, during this period for all seniors has been, a, been an increase in self-employment income, that's the middle bar there. Uh, wages, in fact, has gone down. So people are participating less in the labor market rather than more uh, over this period. But there's that big self-employment number. Investments, in fact, have gone down a little. Now that, I think, is just an artifact of the fact that uh, uh, this would be these numbers, even though they're put in cost of dollars, they have to reflect the fact that interest rates in the early 90s were much higher um, because uh, inflation was higher. And now interest rates are lower, and returns on investment are lower, and, the, and just adjusting for the CPI won't uh, fix that up. So I think that's the main reason for that. Uh, I skipped over pensions, and you can just go to see our RSP withdrawals, which I'm mainly mentioning now because it shows up big in the next graph. Uh, you can sort of see uh, that not too much has happened there. Uh, fewer RSP withdrawals, a little bit more money. Uh, we'll discuss that point a little bit more in the next slide. So the next slide just goes to the top 1%. Now, if we go back and forth between these two slides, one of the things I want to point out is the scales change. So the numbers on this slide are all bigger than the numbers on the previous slide. And you can see they're, they're mostly big green uh, numbers, and they're big positive numbers and big changes. Uh, 
to the top 1%, earnings have gone way up, and that's one of the reasons that the income distribution has become more uh, concentrated, and that's partly wages, and that's partly self-employment income. The self-employment effect is not as, uh, not that much bigger than it was in the previous case, but the wages effect is, is way bigger and, and positive. Uh, the investment uh, figures are positive, too. I think I have some of these circled. Yes, they're, they're all circled because they're all big numbers. And the pensions number, even though pensions is not all that important, it used to be even less important, and, and pensions numbers are a lot bigger uh, for the older population. Now, the RSP withdrawals number, that's a little bit artificial, and that's got to do with, remember, we're going back to tax data. Uh, it turns out that the nature of the tax data uh, is such that um, uh, this isn't getting all your RSP income. Some of that in, is, in fact, embedded in pensions. Um, and there's different ways to take out, and what's happened over time is more RSP money comes out this way than it used to be. So some of this is not a pure trend. It's not just the fact that uh, high-income seniors have got really big RSPs now. Uh, that's part of it, but that's not the whole story there. That's partly an artifact of, unfortunately, a, a a shortcoming in the tax data. Two more quick trends, which I will not go through in as much detail. Uh, if you look at labor market participation, uh, you can see that that blue line at the top, that's the top 1% all ages, and basically uh, you can see that's a um, pretty flat, not flat number uh, for all ages. If you go down to the red number, that's the top 1% from 66 plus, and you can see it is increasing. Uh, but the change in participation rate isn't really the big thing that's going on. It's the wages that are received by those participating in the top 1% that have changed a lot. That's the big number. Where meanwhile, you can see the, um, the green number is that there's been a slide in labor force participation uh, for all filers over this period. Um, and uh, but that hasn't been the case in the 66 plus population. So it's, it's gone up a little bit. And then finally, there's a slight trend toward having some private pension income, um, but it's not there for the top 1%, um, even though the pensions that the top 1% do receive are a lot larger, it's not largely a participation effect. So this is my final round of conclusions. Uh, senior income is labor income and investment income, and both have become more concentrated in the top end, and that's increasing concentration over time. Uh, high senior labor participation, higher, growing for both the top 1% and for the senior population as a whole, a, a well-known trend that lots of other people have documented. Uh, pension income is not so important in the, in the increasing concentration. Uh, it's not the reason. It's not big pensions, rather. It's big continued, at least what is reported on tax, for tax data, is big continued labor market participation um, and uh, some things going on in the investment side. And uh, again, uh, some implications for tax transfer policy. So again, we economists spend a lot of time thinking about the uh, implicit taxes on income that come from, say, the guaranteed income supplement and come from, say, the old age security clawback and programs like that. Uh, and my point here is that for 43% of senior income and probably a lot more, those clawbacks are, are completely irrelevant because these people in the top 1% are way above the range in which those clawbacks make much difference. Um, and so the great bulk of the income is not, those clawbacks don't have much to do with that. Uh, so that affects the way I think you think about uh, those clawbacks and, and, and how they should be um, implemented. Uh, but that is my last point, I believe. I think all that remains for me to do is to thank you for listening to this and looking at all these numbers. I noticed a lot of familiar names uh, on the sheet, and if anybody has any questions, I'm most happy to answer. Great. Thank you very much, Mike, for your interesting presentation. For those of you who may have missed the directions at the start of the presentation, I had asked if you have any questions to please type them into the chat feature, and I will relay them to Mike. That's just because if everyone has the talk feature enabled, we get lots of feedback and we can't hear anyone. So. Uh, any questions, please type them into chat. I'll begin uh, with one question verbally for Mike, and uh, that has to do with some of the income assistance uh, programs that we have in Canada, such as old age security, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do those programs uh, 
have an impact on, uh, how can I say this, do those programs make a difference for seniors when it comes to their income? And has there been any work looking at how those income assistance programs might have an impact on seniors' health? Because you have one camp, uh, if those programs are in some way cut or the amount of money uh, that's distributed to seniors through those programs is reduced, one camp is going to uh, claim that it's going to be a huge disaster. I'm just wondering if there's been any real research looking at how those programs really impact seniors, uh, especially with respect to their health. Okay, I see um, Harry has a question. I think that's going to be related to the first part of my answer, and so I will, I will fold that in a little bit and then I'll answer Harry's question as it comes up. Um, so first I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we know about transfer system and, and income to seniors. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to, I think, answer your question more directly about the, uh, what we know about the health effects, which is not my own research. Uh, so in, in, I've done other research about uh, the other end of the distribution. Um, and basically the way international comparisons are done, rightly or wrongly, in this context, is they uh, look at what's called, uh, well, various sorts of low-income measures, uh, which are usually 50% uh, of the median income for the population. And we see whether, say, seniors, whatever group we're interested in, uh, what their income is relative to that measure which is set for the population as a whole. In this case, say, 50% of the, of the median income in this low-income measure. Uh, well, uh, Canada's transfer program, the GIS, uh, has been set in such a way that it gets seniors very close to the low income measure. Uh, and for a while it was a little bit above and now it's a little bit below and then you get some wobbling around of the poverty rates, the measured poverty rates, which are the rates above and below this measure uh, because of that. Uh, but still even fairly recent things seem to suggest that Canada has low uh, poverty rates for the senior population measured by that way, that by that method. And that's largely because of the guaranteed income supplement. Now, the reason I mention this in the context of your question is just to say that there's a, a good chunk of the lower part of the income distribution, which would be there without that program, that's just pushed up just to that threshold, but not much more. Um, so that's a, a, fair, a fair number of seniors, uh, maybe a quarter of maybe 30% of, of seniors are, are more or less in that state. Now, there are some below that range, and that's largely because for whatever reason it's possible not to qualify for the guaranteed income supplement, and part of it is probably uh, measurement error. Uh, but we, you know, various measures have suggested that that's, there's not that many uh, who do not, even though you know, quantitatively it's a large number, but as a percentage is probably something like 5%. Uh, so that means we've got a lot of seniors who are up to at least that threshold of income, and of course there's uh, publicly provided health care. Uh, compared to some other countries, uh, although most countries have, have similar systems to Canada in that regard. Um, and so basically at that level we think that using that standard of poverty, there are not that many seniors who are below it and that they have access to health care. Uh, so therefore, uh, where does that come across in terms of does that seem to affect their health status? Um, and I think uh, the evidence by and large is that there's, there's weak evidence suggesting that it does positively uh, sustain that health status. Uh, the one place where I've personally done work is I've done some work on drug plans. Um, and there the differences don't seem to be so profound. Um, some provinces have quite good drug plans for seniors and some have not so good. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of health care vari or health uh, status variation uh, due from that. Um, but I think to some extent it's probably trumped by the more general uh, population health care programs and by the, the, minimum, the minimum income systems provided to your guaranteed income supplement. So that doesn't answer your question fully, uh, but I do think that uh, uh, there, is, there is weak evidence in, in Canada that suggests that the income programs have translated into better health outcomes for seniors. Other people on this forum, man, fact, Great, thanks. Right, so there was the question from Harry. Recognizing that data sets are different, what are the data for other OECD countries? Right. 
And so unfortunately, I haven't done uh, the seniors alone uh, for other OECD countries, and perhaps I should have, uh, or known more about it. So I'm sorry, Harry, I can't answer that question very well. Um, I will say for the uh, general population, uh, we know what the data looks like, and the concentration of income in Canada is basically higher than it is anywhere else in the United States, but there's a lot of places that are more or less tied with us, and they would include Australia and Ireland and uh, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, and these are commonly described by uh, Atkinson, Piketty, and Sayez in their work as the English-speaking countries, perhaps uh, not entirely the best use of phrase. Um, I would say perhaps, however, it, it might have something to do with the, the British system of law, which governed all those countries. But it's clearly true that measured income concentration is much higher uh, in those countries than it is, say, in the continental European countries, much lower concentration in France and in Spain and in Switzerland. Uh, Germany, there's a question about the quality of the data that I, that I don't think has yet been resolved. Uh, but also Italy uh, and uh, Switzerland, I'm not sure if I mentioned, um, as well as you'd expect the Scandinavian countries, um, less concentration income at the top. Um, and the other countries that we have a little bit of information on, uh, which we're not sure how much to trust, include countries like China. Uh, if you include those in the pack, then they have more concentrated income than Canada does or the United States. Um, a few of those countries do. But, uh, but I think of the countries where both we rely on the data and have broad economic systems similar to ours, Canada has relatively highly concentrated income. Uh, I do not know, but I expect that to be the case also for seniors income. Great, thanks. Uh, we have another question. Have you had a chance to look at individuals from a longitudinal perspective? Uh, for example, who leaves or re-enters the top 1% or the top 5 or 10% over the years? In other words, what about income variation? Mm -hmm. Oh, again, I'm sorry, I haven't done this for the older population, I've done it for the general population. For the general population, I've done it pretty thoroughly. Uh, it's an actual thing to have done it for the older population, but I haven't. Um, so I can just quickly report the general population result. The general population uh, result was, I think, uh, not as much as you'd think, or at least not enough to offset the trends. So for example, suppose instead of thinking about one-year incomes, we think about incomes uh, for three-year periods or incomes for five-year periods. Um, if there was a lot of going in and out, um, you might think that those ones would have not this big surge of top-end income that we observe in our uh, data for the general population. And the answer is you observe almost the same surge. And it's also the case that uh, the probability of what's being in the top 1% now compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago or even a little bit more, uh, the probability of being in the top 1% and staying in the top 1% is in fact higher now than it was uh, at previous times. Uh, so uh, it does appear there's a fair amount of persistence. It does not appear, for example, that some economists might tell the story, um, but all that's happened is we've got more uh, performance type uh, payments in the general population. And those, some people earn bonuses one year and some people earn bonuses in another year. And really it all works out. There's been no big change. It's just uh, when looked at an annual basis, it looks like there's been a change. Uh, but that does not appear to be the story. The story appears to be that there's been a permanent shift. I will, however, say uh, that some people also argue uh, that the 2008 recession and the time after that was a time at which the top end of the population uh, we're uh, doing well at the expense of the rest of us, and all the data suggests that that's not true, that in fact uh, their incomes proportionately fell more uh, after the Great Recession in 2008 uh, than did those of the general population, uh, still with significant top end concentration. Great, we have another question. How do you think the baby boomer will change income distribution at the top? Okay, so this I think goes over to uh, Thomas Piketty because we're now thinking about the forecast and, and his famous forecast is that the income distribution is going to become more unequal, uh, largely because what we've been observing so far has been a big increase in wage income concentration. Uh, so much of the reason for the, the patterns I've shown you uh, can be traced to higher labor income, uh, either received by the general population, uh, currently or by the retirees 
during the period uh, in which they were in the, the labor market. Uh, and and uh, Tama argues that there will be this uh, shift over to capital income, partly because the baby boom will continue to have this unequal labor income distribution, and that will more and more translate into the amount of resources they have when retired. Uh, and also because he argues uh, that what matters in this uh, context is the, is the rate of interest, which is the return to capital, uh, relative to the uh, to economic growth. That if you've got a really high return to capital, then that will just improve the, the lot of capitalists uh, relative uh, to the rest of the population more and more. Uh, I think, um, so Tama is in effect predicting that the uh, rate of return on capital is going to go up, that right now we have this unusual period of relatively low rates of return on capital and it's expected to go up, and he's a pessimist about growth. He thinks that the rate of growth is going to go down. Uh, I'm not so sure about the rate of return on capital, uh, but I agree with him that unfortunately I do believe the, rate, the, the best forecast is that the rate of growth uh, for the economy is going to fall, uh, partly simplistically because part of that rate of growth is the number of children we have and people are having fewer children. I do not see that trend uh, changing greatly. Um, and the other reason is that uh, there does appear to be, at the moment, some sign of uh, diminishing returns in the innovation process uh, that's leading to, to lower growth. Uh, we're getting the fast growth economies like uh, China, India uh, are getting closer to us and there may be some reason to suspect that their rates of growth will start to fall um, and that not only will hurt them but that will probably hurt us as well. Uh, so for a mixed uh, set of reasons, I think the baby boomer will face uh, income distribution more concentrated at the top, both for the general population and for the older population, uh, still more concentrated than we have now. Uh, but it is a forecast, and it, it is just that, right? I do not have uh, strong statistical reasons to believe that. That's largely based on my reading of... Uh, the Katie's book and the parts that I thought were... Great, thanks. A question for from me. Um, have you looked or are you aware of any work that has looked at uh, income distribution differences between uh, Canadian-born and immigrant seniors? I'm just reading some data here that immigrants account for about 28% of all seniors in Canada, and I'm wondering if there might be differences between uh, immigrants and non-immigrants in terms of their income? Um, yeah, they actually do a little better in terms of market income. And uh, the reason for that appears to be that they do worse in terms of transfer income because some immigrants don't qual qualify for the full range of transfer income. So when I did my study now getting a bit dated uh, seven or eight years ago and found that uh, using that low-income measure, 6% of all seniors were below the low-income measure, uh, about a third of that 6% were immigrants. And the reason for it was that they did not qualify for the guaranteed income supplement. I see. Great. Uh, are there any other questions from any members of the audience? Now is your last chance to type a question if you would like to have a question, or even if you want to make a comment about uh, some of the issues that we've discussed over the last little while, please go right ahead. People can feel free to send me an email if they think of questions later or things that they wish to talk about in more Great. detail. That would be fantastic. By all means, um, get in touch with Mike if you have any further questions. And that will then conclude our seminar for today. Mike, thank you very much for presenting this interesting discussion. This, oh, oh no, sorry, I thought we got a question, but someone is complimenting you. Thank you, this was super interesting. Indeed it was. Thank you very much for uh, presenting. This marks the first time, we've been doing these seminars for at least a couple of years now. This marks the first time that we've looked at seniors and aging from an economic perspective. So it was certainly uh, quite enlightening. Um, because of that novelty aspect, we've tended to focus more on health outcomes in these presentations. So once again, thank you very much, Mike. And just before we log off, I'd like to uh, announce our next seminar. It's going to be on December 4th between 2 and 3 in the afternoon Eastern Time. And Heather Keller 
a professor at the University of Waterloo, will be presenting older Canadians' food intake and nutritional status, how the CLSA will advance knowledge. So we look forward to that one on December 4th. And once again, Mike, thank you so much. All right, have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your support for these seminars. Have a good day.